Okay, I think we are online now. Apologies to, to everyone. Uh, we are having some technical problems, um, but uh, we are doing our best to get them, get them solved. And um, despite the lack of some speakers currently who, who seem to have network problems, we decided that we will get started with the seminar and we are hoping that uh, the others will be able to join us later. So good morning to everyone and welcome to this uh, seminar called Sustainable New Ways of Life, Business Models and Social Renewal for the Future. Uh, the seminar, which is due to viral reasons online only, is a part of the Sustainable Futures webinar series organized by the University of Turku. My name is Jan Hermes. I work as an assistant professor at the University of Oulu, and it is my pleasure to guide you through today's seminar. You may have heard of the Brundtland Report, which is often referred to when talking about sustainability. It was published about 35 years ago, and the report's key message, roughly speaking, is that in order to be sustainable, we need to meet not only the needs of present, so our generations, but also of future generations. I think the report can be considered a timeless piece because until today, we haven't really been able to develop ways of living that would allow future generations to meet their needs. Even more so, parts of our present generations cannot meet their needs. Why is that? From a socioeconomic perspective, and put very simply, one could say that we are consuming too many resources and produce too much waste, and both is often done in a socially unfair manner. It is becoming more and more obvious that, taken together, this threatens future generations' possibility to meet their needs. In other words, it is not sustainable. So what can be done? One way forward is the harmonization of economic, social and environmental bottom lines, which requires nothing less than a fundamental transformation of the status quo. Business organizations, the public services sector and universities are important stakeholder groups in this transformation process. They possess the power to change how we think of our life and how we organize it. And they have already started doing so by engaging in ideas such as green growth and circular economy based business models. But is this the right way? And if so, is it enough? Or is it just patchwork that may even serve to preserve the status quo? In the following six presentations, we will hear about ideas that are supposed to make the transformation toward true sustainability successful. It is my pleasure to welcome in chronological order, Jyrki Katainen, president of the Finnish Innovation Fund Citra, Juha Kaskinen, director of the Finland Futures Research Center at the University of Turku, Pekka Hanninen, dean of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Turku, Riku Santala, Professor of Practice at Turku School of Economics, Katriina Sivonen, University Lecturer and Adjunct Professor at the University of Turku, and last but not least, Maya Rita Ollila, who is Professor of Practice at Turku School of Economics. I can see that by now all of the speakers have joined us. I'm, I'm very glad about that. Welcome to everyone. So each presentation will be about 15 minutes long and followed by a discussion. And if you in the audience would like to contribute to the discussion, which I very much hope for, please post your comment or question in the chat function of this Zoom session. Uh, thank you to those of you who already shared your questions up front. And then finally, I would like to apologize already at this point for not being able to bring forth every raised question, uh, and that is due to the given time schedule. Now, without further ado, I would like to hand over to Jyrki Katainen, our keynote speaker, who held several high positions in politics in Finland and the EU. He currently functions as the president of Citra and sees 
sustainability as a potential source of growth. Jurki, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And good morning, everybody. Luckily, we managed to, to, to go over the technical problems and we are here now. So today I will talk about the sustainability as a source of growth. And in this presentation, I look at sustainability only through ecological dimension. So I don't concentrate on social aspect that much. So we are in the midst of paradigm shift in many ways, but especially market economy uh, as an economic model is in change. Uh, it's not in change uh, in terms of the way it functions, but uh, the driving forces of market economy and motivational factors are in change. So uh, as we all know, the market economy itself doesn't have any values by nature. It only have, has features. People, politicians, consumers, and customers determine the values of the market chains. And this is exactly what I meant when I said that motivational factors and driving forces behind market economy system is in chains. So in other words, if we want to maximize the sustainability benefits, what the economy can produce, we have to take care that the, the factors which enables market economy to function efficiently uh, works well. So sometimes, at least in the past, uh, market forces and market economy has been seen as a, the worst possible enemy to the sustainability. And this is true if we, if we don't change anything. But if it change the motivation factors behind the market economy, then we can use the market economy as a tool to maximize sustainability. And this is something I believe strongly that we need to, to combine sustainability needs to the way the market economy is functioning. Otherwise, we cannot get the benefits of sustainability. There are three main elements. elements in ecological dimension of sustainability. The climate change, there's a necessity to address the climate change. Biodiversity loss, which I'm going to say a couple of more words later on, and circular economy. So we all know basics or quite a lot about climate change and how to address it. Consumers can make sustainable solution in order to reduce their personal carbon footprint, for instance. This is quite well-known factor already now. Companies are doing new investments in order to reduce their carbon footprint because the customers and clients are asking them to do so. so. So the direction is clear when it comes to the address, addressing climate change. But biodiversity loss is somewhat more new phenomenon. I believe that within the next five years or 10 years, biodiversity loss, loss issue will be as big issue as climate change is today. So the market economy and companies and consumers must to adapt to new ways to address biodiversity loss. Globally speaking, biodiversity loss is getting worse like never before. There are two main factors behind this. First of all, there are more people on globe than ever before. And second, our linear economic model is larger than ever before. Some 90% of the loss is connected to the way we deploy and extract and produce raw materials. And 90% of raw materials end up being reduced. So these two facts alone are good reasons to, to change our current linear economic model. Circular economy is partial but significant solution to address biodiversity loss, as well as climate change. So 
to, to finalize this, uh, this, this first part of my presentation, I must say that there's a necessity to create new market-based solutions to address biodiversity loss. Circular economy, for sure, is one of the reasons, uh, one of the ways to address biodiversity loss, but we need more. I have a couple of examples which I'm going to present later on. So, if, for instance, 30% of uh, our land and water area will be protected by law, what happens in 70%? So, we cannot let the 70% untouched in terms of protecting uh, biodiversity of our globe. So next, I will concentrate on uh, circular economy. And especially, I would like to present some concrete examples how circular, circular economy has de developed in, in Finland. We can go to the next slide, please. So the development is taking off quite well. And Finland, I must say, is one of the top countries uh, in terms of uh, developing new circular economy business models. I previously worked in the European Commission and I was in charge of uh, circular economy policies. Mainly, we concentrated on regulatory dimension of boosting circular economy. So circular economy was seen as a significant part of single market project of Europe. And we wanted to uh, create favorable business environment to boost circular economy business models. And there, in this work, I recognize that Finland, together with Denmark and Sweden, are on top of the world when it comes to, to circular economy development. But still, we are in the, the beginning phase of this journey. Next slide, please. So we can probably jump next three in order to save time. And let's go to the slide number seven. Citra has listed uh, the most interesting circular economic companies since 2017. Our aim is to show good, show good examples how some businesses have already adopted a circular economic business models and thus encourage the others to follow suit. We have categorized five different business models which uh, illustrates how differently uh, companies can uh, achieve a, uh, a circular economic business model concentrating on different factors. For instance, product life extension is one uh, business model category. Their products are used according to the original purpose for as long as possible, or repaired, or repurposed for multiple reuses. Product as a service is the second way to organize business according to the circular economy principles. Their customer pays for certain functions or performances and avoids the risk of ownership. Sharing platforms, they are also familiar with many of us. Their digital-based platforms are used to promote and increase the use of goods and resources and the extension of the life cycle. Renewability means that renewable, recyclable, and biodegradable matters, materials are at the core of this business model. And finally, reuse efficiency, resource efficiency, and recycling is the fifth. Next, I will showcase a few um, pretty well-known companies which have changed their business models to become circular. Traditional and famous tractor producer Valtra, for instance, has changed the business models to become circular. Every time when they sell tractor uh, to someone, they put deposit on gearbox. Similarly, as we have a deposit scheme on Coke bottles of beer cans. The reason for this business model is that Valtra wants to get the broken gearbox back for repurposing it. And they want to resell it. So they have calculated that, that to produce brand new gearbox means a lot of uh, workforce, lots of uh, work-related costs. It means lots of material-related costs. It, it means a lot of design-related costs. 
and it makes economic sense just to uh, repair broken parts of gearbox and resell it. So it's a good business and it also saves uh, scarce resources. The next example is uh, Lindstrom, which is also quite well known work where producer in Finland, they kind of lease or rent workwear. So it's in their intention to uh, produce as durable workwear as possible so that they, keep, they can keep the workwares uh, as long as possible in the market. So they take care of the maintenance of the workwear. And as uh, vice president, senior vice president Kaisa, Anna Kaisa Huttunen says, we reduce overconsumption of textiles and save natural resources. Next um, is uh, Fixu Ruoka, which brings surplus food from the restaurants to people's doorsteps. And in this business model, they, uh, they can reduce uh, food waste. Uh, and next is Swopi, also quite well known brand in your in 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 Finland. They repair uh, smartphones. This was not possible in terms of costs, cost efficiency a few years back, but now it's a good business. So so it's quite striking that people buy a new phone about once every one and a half years. So it doesn't make any sense. So they, they give a longer lifespan to smart smartphones by, by repairing them. Finally, I want to show you uh, something which is completely new. This is also part of Citra's current uh, uh, area of concentration, because we want to concentrate on biodiversity and market uh, market change and consumer behavior in the future. So, as I said before, in order to address biodiversity loss, we need to find market-based solutions to address this, this problem. And this is one of the uh, first project of us. We are financing together with SOK Corporation uh, a trial or experimentations which bases on the University of Uvestules created method, how to calculate nature footprint. So the project makes ecological impacts visible and helps organizations to understand how their ecological footprint is formed, what part of its value chain has the biggest negative effects and how to ease burden on biodiversity. So this is something new, we have not heard similar type of uh, measurement happening anywhere else. So this may be one of the first in, in global scale to try to do something like this. So um, measuring is a starting point of doing something differently. And we are happy that um, such a big company as SOK Group or Corporation is part of this experimentation. And, and we do hope to, to team up with all who are interested in similar type of approach, how we could encourage market operators, companies to take care of their ecological footprints and how to monetize nature values. We already now know how to measure carbon footprint, but ecological footprint is something we have not uh, tried to measure earlier, but this is necessary. Uh, then we can jump to the slide 17, and that's my fi final, um, final point. When talking about market economy, uh, the key factor in, in its functioning is consumers and individuals. So we need to incentivize individuals to, to raise pressure on services and product producers to behave more sustainably. And one uh, tool to raise awareness amongst the citizens, which Citra has created, is a lifestyle test. It's been in operation for five years now, and 1.2 million Finns have, or at least 1.2 million times, 
It has been downloaded and made, and uh, it's a quite significant number. So it basically helps people to test their personal or measure their personal carbon footprint, and it gives also advices and ideas how uh, everyone can reduce their personal carbon footprint. This way is key for, for creating new market, which is based on sustainability needs. So it's not only private sector and companies who are key, key parts of the market economy, but also those who are buying the products and services. So that's why uh, everything what we can do to, to encourage individual con uh, consumers to change the market is so important. This live, um, uh, this test is getting uh, international now. For instance, just a couple of weeks ago, City of London announced that they will take the Citrus lifestyle test to their, their website and they will customize it for, for British consumers. And the EU is funding uh, a project which will make it possible to spread the test throughout the European Union. So ladies and gentlemen, I will stop here and I'm ready to answer your questions, but I'm also very interested in hearing your views on this. And, and especially I'm interested in hearing if there is anybody who is um, willing to, to join the journey to, to find market-based approaches to address biodiversity loss. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jyrki Katainen. Thank you very much for an interesting outlook into, into the future. Um, there are a couple of questions that I can see that were posted. Um, uh, Riku actually is asking, uh, how do you see the roles of companies and smaller firms in developing sustainable business? Yeah, I, well, if the whole market is changing, then it means that value chains are forced to change too. So, so um, it doesn't go like this, that only big companies are part of this future development, that smaller companies cannot, cannot be part of it. So if the whole paradigm is shifting, if, if the sustainability is elementary part of, of um, of entire economy, then it means that also smaller businesses must be part of it. As a supplier of uh, certain knowledge or, or products, or, or then they are serving their own customers whose um, ideas what is sustainable and what, what do they want to consume is, is in change. So in certain uh, business areas, it's natural that some big companies may be forerunners, creating a new market, and smaller can follow, follow them. But in others, the whole value chain must change uh, at the same time. Um, the way I understand stand the, the market renewal that you're calling for is that um, we're talking about a form of conscious market where all actors in the market gain a new level of consciousness about what is happening around them. And I am wondering, is that realistic? Are we, are we able to get there where we meet in a marketplace and we really take into account ecological aspects or is this um, is this maybe uh, too lofty of a thought? Well, I give an example which may show quite rapid progress in this respect. Uh, who would have thought five years ago that vegetable-based proteins are sold so much as they are today? So even biggest hamburger chains are offering vegetable um, hamburgers and a number of new products and new brands uh, offering, for instance, oat-based protein products is, uh, it's, uh, is huge today. So this shows quite well that the values in the market can change quite fast. So 
so I do believe that this is the way we are going to, and, and there are very encouraging signs of it. But of course, if looking at um, uh, CO2 emissions, we don't see a big shift yet. But nevertheless, uh, I, I mean, who, who today buys a car today, which is polluting a lot? And I, I believe that majority of those who are planning to change a car or buy a new car pays attention to the emissions. So I, I see very encouraging signs, but we are not there yet. There was a related question. How large do you see consumers' role compared to companies? And do you think it should be talked about more? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, we can push both forward at the same time. The bigger the demand is for sustainable products and services, the more products and services there are. So, so consumer is a king. But at the same time, um, companies can create new markets. For instance, I don't know how many of us uh, if, if using the same example, what I already mentioned earlier, uh, how many of us would have uh, would have demanded oat-based proteins five years ago? But when researchers and companies made it possible, then I started to consume oat-based proteins. So, so both are needed. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm jumping here a bit back and forth between questions as they come. Um, one person from the audience asked, how do you see CO2 compensation schemes as a means for circular economy? And is it more band aid than re-engineered market mechanisms? Um, I think we need CO2 compensation schemes too. But um, there is also limits in its use. The best is always to reduce the CO2 emissions as, as much as possible. But um, it's not always possible and there we need compensation schemes. So I don't see this as a black and white question. The main, main objective must be to reduce the CO2 emissions. But, but um, these compensation schemes are also needed. I, I must tell you one example what is, what is on Citrus um, working table. Now we are helping, for instance, the cities of Lahti and Jyväskylä to create uh, nature compensation schemes. So that the municipalities, we, all, we have also consulted uh, city of Espo in this. So when the cities are doing something which cause harm to the nature, they can compensate this harm uh, elsewhere. So we end uh, up being in no net loss uh, environment if everything goes well. So this compensation can be transferred to, to nature part also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, those schemes exist in, in different forms um, around the globe and, and one one um, criticism that I have read about is that um, if I buy a fly ticket today uh, and I click on the button, I would like to, this to be CO2 compensated, then I actually don't really know what is happening and mm -hmm. money goes into different forms. So it, it seems actually like it is uh, yet another way to, to make money without real ecological benefit. Yeah, there are, there are, there are good and bad examples on that. And, and it, it just show how underdeveloped this type of market is today. So we need to uh, demand as good transparency from, from compensation schemes as we are asking from, from any other businesses. So if we want to make sure that social rights of workers are in good shape and the products are not made by uh, shy labor force or anything like this. So, so we need the similar type of, uh, of uh, transparency from, from conversation schemes too. Yeah. I would like to pick up another question from the audience. 
um, where is the golden balance between minimizing one company's waistlines versus just utilizing it for another's resource in mm -hmm. an ecosystem? And should we aim to minimize or create closed loops? No, that, that's a good question. I'm afraid I cannot give a good answer. But that's a good question. So, so uh, I understand the logic that if there is incentives to produce as much waste as possible because somebody's paying for getting for uh, uh, for a raw material to produce something something else, it, it's not sustainable. So um, that's really a good question. Uh, well, it's always better not to produce um, too much waste. So in ideal case, the company is not producing waste at all, or if there is a waste in some part of the production, they could use the residues for, for producing something else. But this is not always possible. So uh, I'm afraid, as I said, I, I cannot give a complete answer to this, but this is certainly an issue which must be kept in mind. So uh, in order to avoid um, to create false or, or wrong incentives. Yeah. As you said, I think you said it in the beginning, this requires a different view on, on markets. And I would say we need to go even a step deeper. It needs to, it requires a different view of, of how we are willing to lead our lives and uh, where we set our preferences, both when we go about business and, and in our role as consumers. Exactly. Uh, here's another question from the audience. Um, we have a history with the light bulb conspiracy and other moves that were good for business but had bad environmental effects. How can we overcome this kind of business acts in the future? Yeah, I, yeah, I probably can give only partial answer to this. Um, um, when we talk about circular economy or more sustainable economy it means that the market must be regulated differently than before and every once in a while it happens that there's a good intention to regulate the market but but uh, time will show that this particular piece of regulation did not function as, as it was uh, as it, it was designed or meant to function and this is reality in the current economic system, but uh, it's the same challenge even when we are promoting circular economy. So market regulation is never easy. Everybody can agree that we need new regulation, which encourages businesses to, to change the business model to become circular. But, uh, but then how to do the trick it's not at all easier in circular economy or in sustainability issues than in linear and polluting markets. So, so yeah, the, as I said, this is just a partial answer to your question. I, I've been, uh, uh, I have my own experiences on that. I was a European regulator on circular economy and, and um, sometimes it was really difficult to find right measures because uh, some good ideas might uh, or they 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 were not good ideas when you went deep enough so um i found very often myself in a in a place where uh the initial idea was bad because it was sub-optimizing some, some uh, businesses or sub-optimizing the results. So, um, so it, 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 I, it was very rewarding when we get something good to, to good done, but, but sometimes technology, for instance, had changed during the journey and the market was completely different when the legislation came into force. So market regulation is not easy ever. 
you see there to be a risk that there are different or differing interpretations and related regulations of, for example, what a circular economy means globally. Yeah, that's always also a risk. And also when you are doing a regulation, there are vested interests or different companies, depending on the location in value chains, can see the regulation very differently. So even if uh, we regulated a plastics market, for instance, depending on which part of the value uh, plastics value chain you are, you might put focus to different place in regulation. And, and um, this is also a challenge. But then, of course, completely different interpretations, what is sustainable and what is not, is, is, um, is there as a permanent feature. But I think that this is, um, this is a problem that needs to be overcome if we actually want to globally change the way we go about um, acting in the market. So how, how can we do this? How can we achieve this common understanding and a common form of regulation then? Well, um, the one way to look at the question is to recognize that the EU is the smallest meaningful regulator for Finns or for Europeans. So if we don't have a European wide regulation, then we cannot achieve anything. EU is also a powerful negotiator vis-a-vis -vis third countries. And um, it's always better if we manage to do something in global level or even G20 level. So there are some, some uh, exercises going on uh, in G20 level, uh, which is uh, an OECD level to to form global regulation on certain certain things but the eu is um, has has um, proven to be quite influential global uh, player once it gets something done for instance this financing taxonomy is very important and interesting i know all the risks and and the problems around it but um, it's a good sign that something um, uh, something can be done, even if it wasn't the perfect model. Mm -hmm. If you allow, I'll, I'll take one last question from the audience. How do you see the future of biodiversity in the context of Finland's forest industry and growing demand for preserving resources versus growing new economies? Yeah, I know, I know that forest industry is um, in very important place so it's easy to say that we have not done enough in order to protect our own um, biodiversity but it's also easy to say that those who owns the forest and who use the forest for instance forest industry has done quite a lot and they are doing more i give you an example for instance upm well-known uh, traditional paper company in Finland uh, is one of the first, probably the first, for, uh, certainly first in Finland, but uh, I, I bet it's the first company in the world which has connected its financing costs to uh, biodiversity targets. So um, they have a special fund within a company um, which interest rate varies according um, whether the company has achieved its CO2 and biodiversity targets. So there is independent panel who is analyzing whether UPM achieves biodiversity targets yearly. And it, it does, uh, interest rates are lower. If it doesn't, they get up. So this uh, very fascinating uh, business innovation. So what I try to say is that we don't need, in order to address biodiversity loss, we should avoid identity policy and we should join forces to address the issue. So uh, business operators like paper industry has a natural interest to do things right because the clients are very, very um, much uh, asking this. 
but at the same time we have to acknowledge that we haven't done yet enough so so that's why i i do hope that that the biodiversity issue wouldn't become a similar type of identity policy in politics uh, as climate change been because um, the more we fight against each other the less there are results so um despite regulatory uh, challenges that are still around and probably will be for a while there are as i see there are many many ideas um on a business on an organizational level of uh, how to how to move faster towards sustainability okay thank you very much there are more questions now in in the chat i'm sorry we uh, we need to continue we need to carry on from here thank you very much Jürgen thank you and uh, we will move on to the next next presentation um, by Juha Gaskinen on the obstacles and slowdowns in the implementation of the circular economy. Juha, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. I hope my you hear my voice and see my slides. Perfectly, yes. Thank you very much. Um, after a couple of scary moments in the morning, it's nice to be here. So luckily the university network is back on. Um, I will share a couple of ideas um, about the obstacles and slowdowns in the implementation of the circular economy. But, but to start with is perhaps I repeat what, what Mr. Katanen already said, but, but a couple of things about the features of the circular economy. So, uh, um, so the main idea is go from a linear business model to a circular business model. So this includes recycling, recovering, remanufacturing, redesigning, reuse, uh, reusing, and so on. Very important features, life cycle thinking. Um, and see the business, uh, business is connected to each other. Uh, we need resource transformation, it's not just an economic issue. It's also environmental issue, as we have heard, and it includes many social aspects. As a development platform, it can be said that this is a, the quadruple helix is, is, is in a way the organizational model to promote circular economy. Uh, to myself, I see circular economy as a subcategory or additional category of bio economy in which we try to uh, get rid of using non-renewable uh, natural resources and compensate them and compensate we should use the renewable uh, resources so that the renewable resources are not exploited too much so this is the really big picture of, of circular economy at least to me so there's a lot of potential and, and drivers for, for circular economy, as mentioned already in Mr. Katani's presentation. Of course, big things are climate change. So we really have to do something in order to, to get uh, at least adapted to climate change. I'm not quite sure if we can stop climate change anymore, but at least we should should uh, make measures that that help us to adapt to the climate change uh, changes. Scarcity of scarcity of resources is one thing. We are really exploiting our nature so that that we will end up in a really big problems if we don't do anything. There are a lot of examples on that. For example, how we treat our our seas and fishes. What, how, what is happening uh, according to uh, strategic uh, metals, uh, for example, phosphorus that we use a lot of as a fertilizer and so on. Urbanization is mentioned here because, because the urban areas are growing. They are the place where we do things more and more. So they are the hubs of activities. Biodiversity losses is mentioned uh of course here 
and it's it's a new big thing in the environmental uh, discussion, environmental policy discussion, even if we have known already several decades that we are losing biodiversity. So it's again one thing that we have have waken up uh, just now. Of course, we want to avoid pollution and contamination, do some really good waste management. And uh, the rising environmental concern of, of uh, our people is, uh, is creating also political pressures towards to try for circular economy. And in more theoretically speaking, there are, of course, critics towards existing economic model. So do we need growth to develop or not? A uh, couple of other things. There's a lot of expectations that we expect from, from circular economy. We are aiming for perfect material flow and production cycles. We want to renew our industrial production. And thinking about decoupling of economic growth from environmental damage. We want to change our consumers to prosumers for service creation. Of course, the waste reduction is there. Shift to renewable energy uh, production, elimination, the use of, of uh, harmless chemicals, and so on. So there's a lot of uh, expectations that we expect uh, expect from circular economy. So, so there's a lot of ex uh, expectations. So how to answer this? Uh, so I don't know if there is enough talk about the economic growth paradigm. So we don't really unquestion it, perhaps so often that we should, at least from, from a general, uh, as a general questions that we should be thinking of. Uh, how do we achieve win-win situation for the in environmental issues and economy in practice? So, Business benefits are emphasized, but how about the wider perspective of sustainability and in improvement? We have to think about societal action, uh, cultural approach. How do we take citizens uh, uh, involved in uh, circular economy uh, processes and so on? As we heard already, the citizens are quite, actually quite important part, part in, in and circular economic implementation. Um, and of course, as, uh, as said a little bit earlier uh, in one of the questions, so environmental crisis and operation obstacles might occur when we renew our, our economy towards say circular economic practices. So actually we can create new problems when we are heading for new things. And this is probably something we have to take into account. Um, we did a, in FFRC together with city of Turku, we did a um, small survey in, in October, November last year among the companies in Turku region uh, on the question how they see the circular economy obstacles. Um, and there are a couple of things from that survey I want to mention here. So one of the major obstacles the companies in Turku region at least see is the resource ownership. So who really owns the possible circular economy uh, resources and material? So uh, if, if somebody, uh, somebody's producing from their perspective waste and uh, should they uh, do they own it can they sell it is somebody able to buy it is it free for all or is there any any market mechanism all this this is one of the main things that was mentioned as an uh, as an obstacle of course there is a lot of complaints about the existing legislation and regulations. So from, especially from the perspective that there, the old rules, so to speak, doesn't give space for circular economy uh, solutions. Uh, 
Another point of uh, legislation is the lack of promotive legislation. So there are no, no subsidized or, or rules that encourage companies to pursue for circular economy activities. A little bit smaller thing, but actually quite important, at least in the European and Finnish context, is the, is the competitive tendering. At the moment, it doesn't include uh, circular economy requirements. And this is probably one of the things down on the regional and perhaps also on a national level that should be taken into account in, in coming years. So we, this could promote the circular economy quite a lot if we, if we include uh, CA requirements in competitive tendering. Of course, there is always a complaint about the lack of competence and political decision makers. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not quite sure if this is totally true, but, but anyway, the companies see that, that the decision makers actually don't understand very well what, what it means to, to implement circular economy. And also political decision making seems to be slow, at least to in the minds of, of the companies here in Turku region. And perhaps a, a little bit different thing is, is the, the value issue. So in ways of thinking, and this also refers the values of companies inside of the companies, ways of thinking in the companies, and also the values and ways of thinking of consumers. Uh, we have heard already good examples how things have developed over the last few years concerning, for example, the environment and consciousness of, of, of citizens. But there are, of course, still some values, ways of thinking, path dependencies also that, that might hinder and actually, I think, hinder the implementation of circular economy. Lack of good practices and routines. So in order to get, to get the implementation going, it should become uh, business as usual. That would help the companies, companies to implement the uh, actions they should take. So we need examples and good practices uh, in the future. Uh, some national circular economic goals are hard to put into practice. So at least in the local level, the companies see that, okay, we have a quite grand tasks, but how to actually implement them on the local and regional level. So this was mentioned uh, quite uh, several times in the survey. Uh, problems of the side stream functionality and reliability uh, this, uh, is in relation with the ownership issue I just mentioned uh, a minute ago. So the, the market and this, uh, the flow of materials, this has not developed as well as it should. And of course, there are change resistance, both in, in consumers, in organizations, in companies also. And all, I already mentioned fat dependency as uh, one of the things that is, uh, is seen as, as an obstacle for the uh, circular economic development. Uh, we have just published the report last week uh, so, but unfortunately, it's in Finnish. So let's see. If I hope I hope we can make a make an English version of it. But it can be found on a, on our our website already. So, how to overcome these challenges? So the companies see important to take part to the regional circular economy networks following them, assessing the information and communication in them. Uh, all this needs some sort of improvement of our knowledge management. The information and knowledge about circular economy should be spread wider. One way to doing this, especially among the small and medium-sized uh, uh, organizations or firms, 
is developing circular economy business blocks. This is actually quite, quite interesting result. We have to take into account the need of different type of, of enterprises. So small, medium size, micro even, then how involved they are in a circular economy, what type, in what place there are in the life cycle of age materials and so on. So there is no uh, one solutions to all. So the complexity of the uh, field of enterprises have to be also taken into account. We probably need a holistic and systematic approach towards C, and this goes hand in hand with the life cycle approach. So you have to see the big picture in order to see your place uh, as a firm in the whole life cycle and where the business is off. Uh, Quadrupohelix development is, is something that we, we, we also need to overcome the challenges. So in general, rethinking the ownership, developing sharing platforms and use of them, de developing different producer ownership pilot models, assessment of the experience is needed. Of course, improvement of products, longer life cycles by creative uh, planning, making sustainability goals of uh, circular economy better known, widening the goals to all production, improvement and foresight of, of awareness of the value changes and systemic changes. So these are the general ways, more or less theoretical level to do, uh, to do uh, things that, that help us to overcome the challenges of circular economy implementation. And I did it in a 50 minutes and 28 seconds. So I hope Janis, <laughs> Janis uh, congratulations uh, me for that. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Juha. Yes, wonderful. Um, I think, um, yeah, this was, I think, a very encompassing view of what hinders and potentially helps implementing circular economy on, on different levels. And uh, what struck me was, the, the again, the need for, for a regulatory aspect or the regulatory level that plays a big role. You said it, uh, what we currently have in place, the legislation and regulations, they do not necessarily fit um, what we would need in order to be able to follow a circular economy model. Um, I would like to pick up a couple of questions from the audience. Um, let me see, here is one. So um, can business ever be truly sustainable if the base idea is still to sell as much as possible? For example, clothing company uh, H&M, who has done a lot of so-called sustainability actions, but whose business at its core is still unsustainable? Oh, no. <laughs> well, the logic of business, at least so far, is, is, is to make profit. So the, I think the question is where the profit can be made of. So, and the circular economy, I think it's the way to a better way to do sustainable business because then, then you can use and, for example, recycle the uh, clothing materials. So it's, um, so what would be the, uh, another end, it would be some kind of world that there is, we probably would be in some sort of matrix type of world that we actually don't consume that much. And, and uh, so at the moment, when we are heading for the future, I think we, this problem cannot be solved yet, but we have to take this well, smaller steps in order to achieve more sustainable way to produce and to consume issues and circular economy is at the moment i think the best answer to it together with bioeconomy that we can uh, uh, think the materials are circular and use the uh, re renewable resources for our production of course the the uh, we have to think about do we need how much growth do we actually need and this is a, a quite a big 
big uh, discussion, for example, among the environmental uh, uh, economists. So, what is the what is the role of growth in all of, all of this? I think we could live without so many things that we have, but that's my only my personal view. Yeah, a, a related question from a consumer perspective is: What do you think about the attitude action gap? So that people are these days more and more interested to act sustainably, but uh, still do not. This does not show in purchase decisions. Yeah, um, I think my colleague Katrina actually would answer this better than me because this is something at least to my mind to do with the uh, cultural social and environment that we we have so we are all always full of good intentions but how what we in fact do and that, that dictates from the for example on our daily life so what i would use an ex uh, example for example your children want to uh, have hobbies so how how you take them into hobbies? So you take a call. So how to do in this type of situation? One way to diminish, for example, the pollution or, or emissions coming from your car is to is, is to get the electric car or, or things like that. Now, well, then the electric cars have some problems. We are not sure if our lithium resources are. are there are enough lithium sources for all the electric electrification, of course. And that that creates another problem. So again, the the solutions is is in the small steps that we have to take for the bigger goal. And there is no one solutions we can we can take and and uh, and solve these things. So I don't have any better answer to this. But that I think our we as the humans should think more seriously the uh, environmental challenges that we are facing. Unfortunately, it seems that we, we as humans need a some sort of catastrophe first, and then we act, which is usually just too late. There is, uh, yes, I, I would agree to you, unfortunately. Um, this Finnish saying of Kantapan kautta, yeah. uh, learning, yes. Um, and I also agree with you um, that many solutions that we are creating today are maybe solving something, but at the same time, they are creating yet new problems that we then have to create new solutions for. Um, here is another question, um, or actually a comment. Um, a person from the audience wanted to bring forth that a quite significant issue for companies regarding the circular economy based business models is that they often are not profitable, which decreases the motivation for companies to develop these more sustainable business models. For example, it's cheaper to produce a product in China than to resell it in Finland. What can we do about this? <clears throat> well, I think Yuriki should answer this question. Uh, I can only say my <coughs> modest opinion on this. Well, what is happening at the moment is that, that the companies are bringing back their pro production uh, back from uh, China, for example, to Europe. Um, I'm not quite sure that the reason for this is the environmental uh, environmental issues, but uh, but in fact, uh, global. Uh, global economic uh, struggle between the major regions, it might actually bring beneficial environmental uh, outcomes. But, but I don't know, I'm, I'm quite sure that the motivation at the moment is comes from, from different sources than environmental issues. Well, I remember already something like 30 years ago when I started deal with the sustainability issues that we, we think about think about the thing called uh, do it more or less to do it locally and act globally too at the same time. So and this might be a good thing for example on uh, some of the uh, 
sectors of, of production. For example, food is one of those. So you got promote the locally produced food quite a lot. But for example, how about computers? We don't have the components, we don't have the components, uh, materials, if we want to uh, uh, increase our knowledge uh, economy and, and, and develop our, our computers and ACT systems to further on. So there's a constant dilemma with these local global tensions. And, and it might, uh, might be that, that some of the sectors of the businesses can be worked much better in the local than a global level. But I think that we cannot get rid of, rid of the global issue, especially because the challenges that we face have to be solved also in the global level. They cannot be solved also only at the local level. Yeah. Um, in this regard, somebody asks, should the current venture capital business model be reinvented, regulated, and in parentheses, they talk about a post-growth entrepreneurship? Yeah, I've been thinking this question a bit, and, and definitely this new, new challenge, challenge, uh, challenges and the situation of our living in create some space for this type of, of uh, new capitalism, so to speak. So I am hope that we see more examples on that. And through these examples, we can get experiences on how does it work. So I would wait for a couple of years and see if there is enough push for this type of businesses. But I don't know. Does it work? We have to wait and see if it, if it's a, it's a, if it's a solution for, for, to renew our business thinking, business model, and the whole paradigm of our economic thinking. I imagine now hearing some people in the audience saying that we don't have those years, time to wait and uh, experiment. Um, but yes, in, in, in principle, uh, that is probably the way the way to go. Um, I think uh, time time is almost up. Um, I would like to thank you, uh, Juha Kaskinen, for for your view on on the circular economy, what it hinders it, and how it can be overcome. Thank you very much for this. Thank you. And um, then I'm continuing from here um, with our third speech our third presentation um, actually now that we talked about um, looking at certain examples that can um, help carry us into this era of a circular economy uh, re a related um, presentation by Pekka Hanninen on business model transformation in healthcare research and education developing change Pekka thank you the, the stage is yours thank you uh uh, as uh, stated, my name is Pekka Hanen and I'm a, from the background, I'm the professor of medical physics and engineering and currently I'm also the dean of the medical faculty and uh, looking into my background in research, I've been uh, doing my career mostly in, in, in developing diagnostics tools, so, so this is uh, maybe the view point where, which I'm taking also in this, this talk. Now, um, thinking of medicine and how does uh, the sustainability connect to, to, to healthcare. The important parts are obviously uh, related to social sustainability and use and division of resources. And, and obviously, if you are thinking of development of healthcare, here we should think globally. Although at the moment in Finland, we are facing very, very local uh, question with our healthcare and social system renewal that is that is uh, about to take place. Before I actually start, I want to bring you back into what we are in the midst of. Uh, and this has very much to do with, with sustainability. Uh, obviously, um, viruses um, among the most primitive creatures around the world have been circulating around us for a long time, but uh, I don't think there's much disagreement on that, that this is 
the 2020s as, uh, or 2019 uh, SARS uh, COVID uh, pandemic has a lot to do with the way we live nowadays. In fact, if you are looking at literature and uh, and uh, how things have been happening, is we are talking about a, a, a pandemic that is uh, in the same scale as the Spanish flu uh, 100 years back, and and this is striking striking really in in numbers. Obviously, uh, we don't have the full numbers, but it has been estimated that we have about 20, num 20 million people dead by now now because of COVID. And uh, this I just wanted to bring you that, that we uh, sort of like uh, get the view on how we view our, our health. It's been going on for two years uh, and what has been happening is, is this. People are running on the streets and demand that they have the right to go to pubs. Uh, and, and if you're looking at, uh, at what has happened with, with economy, there was a dip people get scared, but after that, what has been going on, obviously governments are pumping money into the, into the economical system, but the growth has been really, really strong and people are just waiting to get out of this. So, so uh, thinking of how important health is to us, this is a very difficult question. And of course, this then, then leads, leads into, into a waste of behavior that we, we take. Now, uh, what has medicine done over the past? Uh, if you are looking at, uh, at uh, for example, how uh, tuberculosis, uh, the left one here, here has evolved uh, over the years, uh, the, the numbers started coming down along with the industrialization and, uh, and uh, uh, growth of the industrial society. You could actually, uh, if you would invert this curve, I mean, uh, you could take the similar curve for any infectious disease and, and you could invert this curve and you would see the CO2 tool on that, that uh, the CO2 would rise on that. And uh, 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 Professor McKeon in the, in the 70s already postulated a hypothesis that, that the growth of population is, is not due medicine, but, uh, but it's, it's primarily thanks to better nutrition and also hygiene and, and medicine has done actually very little. So if you're looking at here, the, the antibiotics came in the 40s and the vaccinations against uh, tuberculosis uh, in the 50s. So, so they did actually very little in the big picture. So I just want you to keep this in mind, mind as we go on. Now, uh, looking at, at data uh, globally about healthcare systems, systems, what can we learn? Now, I have uh, purposely taken um, COVID-19 out of this one because it has some effect and, and look at the big picture on, on uh, without COVID. And uh, uh, for example, uh, we all know that in the US, they spend a lot of money in healthcare, but what does it bring? in terms of healthy life expectancy. If you look at this, uh, this place, uh, it's called actually our world in data, excellent data available from there. So I would really encourage if you wanna know something about our life and data related to our life, that's an excellent place to look into. But if you're looking at healthy life expectancy, so with $1,000 per capita uh, spent uh, on healthcare and with $10,000 per capita spent on healthcare, we get the same result uh, uh, in, in uh, healthy life expectancy. So only if we start totally neglecting the healthcare, the life expectancy starts dropping down. And this is also uh, has to do with the fact that then the, the deaths of, of children start growing tremendously. Now, uh, how, how about being sick? Once you have a disability, uh, a life-threatening disability, what does the money do for you? There is a slight change here at the lower end, so that if you have a disability in Colombia, for example, you live in average about nine years with that. In the US and in the Western country, you, you live 11 years. So, so the modern medicine, all the modern technologies have bring you two years. 
in big picture, this is rather little. So, so uh, going forward in with data, uh, if we look, for example, uh, where should we put our money? And and uh, obvious answer is children. If you look global data on where do children die, infections we see and and uh, diseases that we do not experience here in the Western countries, especially in Finland, are are major causes of of uh, of uh, of deaths in children under five. If we compare this to what we have in Finland, these are complicated disorders. The children do not die in Finland. This is Finland is one of the best countries in the world, if not the best, in 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 avoiding uh, child death. So, so comparing these two, it's, it's really really clear where investments should go. So, children are one place. Looking at, at grown-ups, the difference in global and in Western world is not that big. The uh, two major killers are cardiovascular diseases, for which we know that lifestyle, the nutrition, all those things can be used to, to prevent that. The question is only to get people to do those things, which we know that need to be done. Cancers are another one. And cancers are the ones that, that, that probably uh, the most effort in, in research goes into how to cure cancer. Now, looking into, into this, uh, this uh, uh, it's, it's clear that, that uh, if we're looking at, at all these diseases here is, is that, that uh, and, and looking at how the healthcare systems work, uh, where we should put our efforts is, is, the, is the prevention of these diseases and early detection. Today, the best detector of uh, disease is our body, which has there, been there as the same detector for, for, for a long time. So looking at, at today, uh, how do we want to develop the, the healthcare system? System. What is happening today is, is that people are increasingly aware of their health. This is a good thing, obviously. Uh, this is highly dependent on education and social status, which we all are aware of. This is something that our social systems should put effort into education and, and uh, equality in societies. Obviously, this creates new opportunities uh, for technology, education, and then obviously preachers that we know from, from how COVID has been progressing. There are a lot of preachers of false truths, truths there. But if you are looking at technologies, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing one of these technology wonders in my finger here that is monitoring my health. So we have lots of opportunities there there for technology. Now, a new thing that has been really pushing through due two factors. Uh, uh, first of all, because of this COVID uh, uh, pandemic and, and uh, uh, in Finland, for example, most importantly, because we have a lack of resources in, in terms of, of doctors and nurses uh, the, the, uh, remote services. And at the moment, for example, in Finland, there are some areas where more than 50% of health visits are covered by, uh, by remote services. This is an area which then uh, is, uh, is uh, somewhat also uh, disputed because uh, especially older people have trouble of, uh, of, uh, of uh, using these uh, remote services. They have trouble on explaining what their uh, situation is, is, and they do not demand their rights similar to a little bit younger people. People, So they might be left out of some treatment. And also, if you have a first time uh, uh, visit of a patient, it's rather impossible for the doctor to make good diagnosis. So, 
So, so uh, it's not really a, a recommended uh, practice for first time visits. Only if you if you are uh, on a lighter side of the of the of the health visit. But this is these are the problems that need to be handled. One thing that is obviously going to happen is this fitness industry, health tech comes to every day life. So we are going to wear more and more kind of sensors on our bodies. One of the most important sensors that we actually already are wearing all the time is this, this mobile phone. So, so mobile phones we carry and it's full of sensors. There is, for example, a company in Turku that has productized uh, their ideas into into looking at uh, that at uh, at uh, cardiovascular problems. So you just place the the uh, the mobile phone uh, in rest on on your chest, and it will analyze your heartbeat if there are irregularities. On it. Things like that will come come in the future. Mm -hmm. One uh, obvious problem is, is uh, from the educator's point of view that young doctors, when they are doing their, their uh, compulsory time in, 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 in the primary health care, uh, that they are facing, uh, facing opinionated customers, customers that know what they are in need of, although it might be totally wrong. Uh, one thing that I can see that is very important that, that, that the health industry has to start looking growth in, in the developing uh, countries. Many of our Western world solutions, they are not economically nor ethically sustainable. Uh, large uh, pharma, for example, has been developing uh, specialized uh, medication for, for uh, treating uh, cancers, advanced cancers, specialist cancers, and those treatments uh, are so costly that they can go up to hundreds of thousands of euros per patient. And this is not sustainable. We have to move to an earlier, earlier stage where, where we can uh, detect the cancer earlier and treat it at much lower cost. Uh, this cost effectiveness criteria uh, in healthcare, this is something that has already been in part, partially coming into, into that, but that is something that, that that is obviously going to be a big part of our, our uh, healthcare systems. Mm. So a lot of uh, effort in the future will certainly have to go into, into early detection, detection and avoidance of, of non-communicable diseases. We all know that, that the adult type diabetes can largely be avoided if we are leading a healthy lifestyle. This is something that that educators, that people have to take seriously because the cost of adult type diabetes is enormous for, for, for the societies. But it's also a life-threatening condition, it's shortening life. And, and there are a lot of similar examples. One example then is the cancer, which we should, we should be able to detect cancers much earlier through screening campaigns that are affordable, that are uh, done in a, in a way that, that people will also attend them. Uh, one big question, of course, after COVID is, is that, that we put more, eff shall we put more effort on in, uh, if, if effort on infectious disease control, or will we forget? My sort of fear is that we will forget part of it. We see already that uh, on, the, on the neglectance of some of the measures that, that are that are, and the criticism of the measures on, on, on uh, controlling the COVID at the moment. And, and one of the, uh, the important things uh, is that we will learn to use data better. There's enormous, enormous amounts of data available uh, uh, already today that we are not using, using well. And, and this is something that we put effort, effort into. Uh, in education, uh, what we do at our faculty, but this is not unique in a way that this is what all the faculties in Finland do, what, what the medical uh, 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 educators want to do is, is to, to be in close collaboration with all the service providers to get a good feedback on what is needed on, on education. Our problem is that, that starting from a fresh uh, high school graduate to a medical specialist, the shortest time 
span there is 10 years. So if we have a need for something in 10 years, we can respond to that need. And it takes six years to get the license to begin with. Uh, there are growing need areas. So we generate activity on, on, on those areas. We all know that geriatric medicine or psychiatry is, is in, in trouble, but so is general medicine. We don't have enough people on general medicine at the moment, specialists. Patient communication is important, especially important when the patients nowadays are more aware of what's going on. So, so this is an important area. We put a lot of effort into simulation teaching. Still, we can simulate scenarios and then, then uh, uh, things that are not always possible with patients. And also, considering small country like Finland, sometimes we simply don't have the kind of patients that education needs. We do have a science track also for the medical students. Medicine is an area where science is of utmost importance. So people have to grow with science. The medicine changes changes in time so rapidly. And an important thing is that we do multi, multidisciplinary education. And then we have at the university this academic concept where, where um, multidisciplinary, including health related areas are taught to other students and also to the general public. Mm. On the research side, uh, the faculty has um, been profiling for a long time already in drug development. Turku is the hub of drug development in, in Finland, but diagnostics is also, I mean, if you are looking at the company's field, uh, especially in a small, small area, I mean, look, we have lots of diagnostics companies in, 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 uh, in Turku, but also in health health in general, uh, and, and that uh, includes these long-term uh, follow-up studies of, of major non-communicable diseases. Those of you who are from Turku and my, uh, about my age, they will know that, that we've had this strip baby program. Maybe some of your children have participated in that. Similar follow-up studies are, are being made, and the, advan uh, the, the advantage of these follow-up studies is that if you look in the past, in medicine, this is like a window to the future. So, so those are important. Things. We also have interventions and studies with social dimensions. So, so Invest Flagship, which in which uh, faculty of medicine is taking part, is, is one big part. That's just, that's a, that's a, a more social social part. Uh, uh, our uh, psychiatry is in, in that uh, size, uh, children's psychiatry. But then, for example, we have formed a center of excellence for physical activity for children and youth. We know that physical activity is, is a good way of, of, of um, uh, social, uh, uh, it has a good social dimension, but it also brings a healthy lifestyle, uh, uh, lifelong uh, ideas to the lifestyle for, for kids. We put a lot of effort in novel and early diagnostics in Flames flagship has been uh, is, is on that area and and then then we are putting more and more effort on, on, on data sciences we have data scientists in the faculty and i are hiring more more this is something that has changed totally over the last five to ten years in to conclude in my world in my view uh, what we need to do for the future is one of the things that um, Jyrki Katainen already touched in his, in his talk was the, the regulation. From the point of view of, of medical research and innovation, uh, good part of the regulation can slow down and even kill innovation processes. And at the moment, we are in a, in a, in a, in a crisis with regard to biobanking and GDPR regulation in Finland. Uh, this is really uh, uh, happening there, there. If we are thinking, for example, history, uh, X-ray, uh, when uh, Konrad Röntgen uh, invented X-ray, took two years from the in, in, innovation to, for, for the first X-ray machine to come to Finland. It would not happen today. Nothing, anything near that. Uh, we need to challenge dogmas. And even in science, uh, beliefs start take over, in, uh, over data. So, so unjust beliefs uh, is something that if you look if you want to spend a little bit of time of looking at histories of Nobel laureates, that's where they have been struggling. Science has not believed in what they are doing in a long time. Only after a certain time, they have gained, uh, gained uh, uh, success and acceptance. 
And uh, for the future, data is the king. We only have to read it right. We can read data in so many different ways. And, and, uh, and uh, this is something that we have to put our effort on. With that, I thank you and uh, I'm open to questions now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pekka. Um, very interesting uh, opportunities uh, seem to be in, in the field of healthcare, which I always perceived as a rather heavily regulated environment. And you just said that uh, deregulation is, is what uh, would be needed from your perspective. Um, I always thought that regulation exists for good reasons, thinking about patients' safety, data protection and, and other things. So do you see there to be a shift happening from a, sort of a state, a system where the state takes care, authorities take care, to one where we are personally, each of us individually, in charge, uh, including um, our own incentives and our own resources? I think this is an inevitable thinking of how we are at the moment distributing the resources in, in the society. So, so uh, in that sense, education is very important uh, for the masses, I would say. say and and the, the, crisis, uh, the, the uh, risk that we have there is something that already mentioned this. It's, it's the social dimension. Those with less education, those with lower social status easily fall out of, out of this. this. For us, the participants of this seminar, it's it's rather easy to sort of uh, study and, and keep take care of our health uh, on our own. And, and if you're thinking of your life, normally we don't need much doctor at all, all, all. So we sort of like take care of that. But uh, those with so social problems, obviously, that there's a big issue there, and and the governments will not be able to. Uh, the way we are developing the societies to, to take care of everybody uh, at this phase, especially with the aging population. Mm -hmm. Relatedly, one person from the audience expressed their, their doubt about um, the level of trust that you can have in sensors when you are your own doctor in a way, in sensors such as clocks and, and uh, phones and rings. This is uh, something that has to do also with the data. So, so uh, we don't need to trust on, on a single day or a single measurement, but if we are wearing, wearing uh, something continuously, then, then we are generating a stream of data, of data of our lives. And, and as the amount of data grows, the data becomes more reliable. And that's, that's what actually works with this these uh, devices that we carry. Obviously, they are nowhere near medical devices, true medical devices. But once you have grown the data bank of your own actions, then they can monitor changes. And these changes in the body functions are, are the ones that are important. We use our body as a sensor in that, that sense. Mm. OK, uh, here is a, a, a more technical question. Um, one person writes, I understand the potential of sensors, but there is also a growing trend for recognition technology by camera, especially in automotive industry. What's the situation in healthcare field for camera recognition technology and how do you see this technology? Uh, cameras are used actually in, in, in uh, all kinds of environments, obviously as a, as a guidance tool, but also to monitor facial expressions, <laughs> eye movements, all kinds of this, and, and these have diagnostic purpose. So, so obviously, an image tells you more than a thousand words sometimes. sometimes. So, so there are obvious uses for, for cameras and also uh, imaging as such. So, so uh, imaging is, 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 a, is a big part of diagnostic industry. The cameras are a little bit different from the, from the, from the cameras that we carry in our mobile phones when we talk about uh, different imaging devices. Mm -hmm. um, one person in the audience just uh, sent a quote from Mikko Hüppönen from F-Secure. Uh, the quote goes, data is the, the new uranium. So I think this uh, reflects rather, rather well what, uh, what, you're, what you're telling us. Um, here is a question um, that is maybe more socially oriented. Do you think that the growing move towards self-sufficiency in healthcare 
will make societies more resilient? Is the medical field becoming more reduced in the need for transformation in the medical field? Uh, I think this is, I mean, it's an excellent question. And I do not have an answer that I hope that this is the trend that we can find, find there. And I think we have, at the moment, we are in a position of, uh, of taking these chances since we are renewing our healthcare system. If we are renewing it in a way that we are just using the old medicine, so to say, not taking any new innovations into it, then this will certainly lead into problems because then we just move towards the times that, that people do not get healthcare. We have to have new ideas, but this uh, sort of uh, turmoil that we are in the midst of that, this gives us the possibility of going into new paths. It's not going to happen in one or two years, but obviously it gives us, and it gives also the Finnish uh, industry a window to the future on, 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 on how to work. So it, I can see this as a, as a real opportunity, but we have to use it. Uh, you mentioned before that education is key in, in preparing the, the coming generations, the younger generations, for a different way, a different kind of healthcare. Uh, I'm, I'm right now thinking of those other present generations that are maybe not so um, easily adapting anymore, or for different other reasons, will not adapt to new ways of healthcare anymore. So how do we make sure that we do not uh, leave those people out? How do we make sure we give them the kind of healthcare that uh, was promised to them already a long time ago and which they have also financed through, for example, their taxes? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, this is an excellent question and there are no simple answers to that, but obviously we do have to have um, sort of uh, different approaches to healthcare. Uh, for you and me, probably the easiest way of seeing the doctor is that we just go into one of these internet uh, chats and, and explain our problem and maybe have an answer in our email or something like that. But then the younger, uh, the older generation needs to see a doctor. And, and, and of, obviously, if we release time from the, from the healthcare systems to those who have real problems uh, on, on, that are necessary for the, for, to see the doctor or those who have real problems in, in accessing the system, then we probably are able to generate more, more time for them. So I'm, I'm hoping that this digitalization in, in, in turn would also help that. Hmm. But it's a shift, it takes time when uh, in many things, it, takes a generation of time to sort of adopt totally new ways of working. Although we've seen some things happening much quicker than that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Pekka uh, Hanninen, for this insight and at the same time look into the future of, of the healthcare services. Um, now it is time for a little break. It is 11 o'clock Finnish time. We will have half an hour uh, break of half an hour and reconvene at 11.30 uh, finish time, then back with uh, three more very interesting speeches. So please stay tuned and see you in about half an hour. Okay, it is 11.30, time to reconvene. So welcome back to our seminar on sustainable futures. Uh, sustainable new ways of life, business models, and social renewal for the future. Before the break, we heard about how economic growth and sustainability can fit together, how the circle economy can play an important role in this, and what opportunities the healthcare context can provide. Now, I welcome Riku Sandala to talk about universities co-creating responsible futures. Riku, the stage is yours. Thank you, Jan. Uh, I will start sharing my, my screen here. The purpose of this presentation, which I will, will be sharing with you guys today, is, uh, is to describe how universities like University of Turku and other universities, obviously also in Finland, uh, can co co-create responsible future together with you. And uh, I will highlight some um, findings of, um, of a study that we have uh, conducted on uh, 
on the existing ways uh, University of Turku is uh, contributing to this uh, to this topic and uh, what we are planning to do going going forward. Uh, let's start with um, putting um, basically um, responsible responsibility and responsible business into the into the context and how we can understand it and uh, how that reflects to the role of the university in this complex uh, phenomena. Uh, and uh, you know here here's the how we can uh, we can approach uh, responsible business uh, I have described them here cornerstones uh, basically comprising of three items uh, knowledge and know-how values and uh, the time di time dimension in in problem solving and decision making uh, if we start with the knowledge and know-how um, I think it's easy to understand here and relate uh, the, the role of the university in uh, in solving some of the challenges and up or or building the on the opportunities in responsible business with the knowledge and know how we mean broad education based knowledge and understanding of things. Uh, which is very useful also for for companies and uh, obviously for public entities uh, where you can make sure that the, your decisions and your approaches are based on scientific knowledge. Uh, I think universities can have also a role in enhancing the analytical capability. I think Pekka was giving good examples on that one just a few minutes ago. And obviously also the collected, uh, uh, the wisdom, which is, uh, I, I would describe it as a, as a, as a built knowledge and tested knowledge over the time. My role in the university as, as Jan mentioned I'm the I'm the professor of practice in 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 sustainable leadership and on the other hand uh, my role is also to to build on the, on the cooperation between the university and and its uh, <coughs> collaboration partners uh, I also <coughs> hold a um, adjunct professorship in, in strategic change uh, just to put this in the context of my background also and then I think the other aspect, <coughs> aspect where universities can also build a role uh, or, or play a role is, is our values. How can we align values in, in decision making? Uh, uh, there were already very good uh, questions in the chat. Um, um, most of them also involved the economical value. And uh, how do we understand the economical value? How do we build economic, economical value uh, simultaneously, uh, when we are building uh, responsible businesses on, on how we build societal value, the value to the society in general, and also the environmental value like the biodiversity. Uh, and I would say that the, the healthcare aspect would land here, also on the, in the areas of societal value, so the health value of health to society, and obviously also it will contribute to economical well-being of the individuals and businesses. Um, and one interesting approach to these uh, these values could be uh, in the you know the the, ra the rationality in, in value based decision making where um, we mentioned measuring and I think we can logically derive many of our actions and decision based on logical on 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 values that can be also logically esteemed as as being the right one, the right way of, uh, of moving forward. And then obviously the third one here is the, the time dimension. Uh, uh, and I would say, you know, solving complex problems requires time. And I think uh, uh, one important thing obviously is to differentiate between just difficult aspects that we need to decide on. They can be difficult uh, if we don't have the understanding or if we don't have the data if we don't have the information if we don't have the analytical capability or the methods and i think this is another area where university can uh, can uh, help companies and and public entities to solve complex complex problems 
Uh, and the complex problem is typically a problem which is not only difficult, but uh, takes time, or it cannot even be, or it can be even easy to decide, but it still takes time. So that's what I would call complex problem involving many entities. So uh, responsible business, knowledge and know-how, values, and, 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 and uh, solving complex problems over the time where university can, can clearly play a role. Uh, how, do, how do universities uh, collaborate or co-create with, uh, with their environment and their constituencies? Uh, I have written here, University of Turku, from theory to action. And I, what I mean with this from theory to action is that obviously we, the key role in the university is to build on epistemic knowledge and understanding, but also to be able to, to apply it on practical wisdom, which I think Aristoteles used to call uh, uh, phronesis. Uh, and it, it is a very important aspect also for the university uh, to to pay attention to that our theoretical understanding can also build at least over the long term on, on, on the practical, practical decision making and practical rationality in, in society and business. Well, how do we do it? Uh, our strategy, uh, we work closely, what we say that we want to work closely in collaboration with the Finnish society. Uh, we value uh, close collaboration with our national and international networks, and we build strong regional and international partnerships. So I would say that the strategic intent is clearly there, and it, it will be supported by, by the university organization if, uh, if you, as a, as a leader or manager in, in the business or public entity, are interested in working together with the university on solving these issues or building on opportunities on, on, on sustainable business. <clears throat> Methods of collaboration, obviously research and innovation, where, uh, where I, I think the, uh, the benefit would be scientifically tested information for your organization. Teaching and education, uh, building on uh, decision-making methods and practical tools. In, in, in managing and developing an organization. Competence development, benefiting to indivi informed individuals in these matters. Uh, and as we, as we understand it and know it, that the first level obviously is to have the information, to acknowledge things and then to understand it. And uh, I would say the second level is that you test and, and build on projects in your organization on a sustainable business or sustainable future in the public entity. And, and I would say that the third one would be then how do we take it into account in our, in our business models, in truly. Uh, and, and not just an inhibiting factor, but, a, but an opportunity to, to contribute to economical prospering and, and uh, social and ecological. Uh, campus cooperation and communities, keeping up to date with scientific knowledge, being, you can be engaged uh, with, with the university, uh, scholars, teachers, and, and the students. <clears throat> uh, projects, uh, I mean, projects is obviously one, one way of cooperating where, we can, we, where you can also derive very practical, relevant results to your, to your organization. Uh, next, what, what do we do already? Uh, here are some, just, uh, some, some examples, and I know that, that the list is not exhaustive, that, uh, that there are, obviously there could be other examples here on, on the right-hand right column, but uh, I think these are at least relevant uh, for this discussion here today. So need for, if you have a need for cooperation, if it's in the, uh, in, 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 in the research and innovation area, uh, we contribute, it is a strategic focus area, clearly. All, all faculties, when, when we did the, the analysis of the, what's going on in the university, we realized that more or less all faculties are working on, on the topic of sustainability. Obviously, the level of uh, activities in, uh, you know, in this topic uh, varies, and, varies and, and uh, it doesn't have a, value in itself but, uh, unless it contributes to the to the 
to the theoretical knowledge and, and building in, in, the, in the university. But it's clearly a topic. Uh, uh, I would say there's a, just a couple of examples. Uh, there's a program called Etairos. It's the ethical use of artificial intelligence. If you're interested, you can go on the website and have a look. Style, uh, which is a program which basically uh, uh, develops the healthy way of living and how that can contribute to business or, or the well-being of, uh, of a public entity, for example, a city like Turku. AIGA, which is, uh, which is, a, which is a, a project to develop the governance around artificial intelligence, like Pekka, Pekka mentioned in his, uh, on his presentation that uh, you know, if we have proper governance, uh, and which also gives room to development, uh, it will, obviously we need governance to protect the individual, but it should not be such that it inhibits the development of sustainability in business or, or society. So this is the program that builds on, uh, on, uh, on, on the governance on, or around the artificial intelligence. Just a few more, sustainable shipbuilding together with Mayor Turku, KICAT uh, program, which is uh, uh, a program on decision making around accelerated transition of sustainable circular economy. Beautiful is a program of, uh, of, of leadership and decision making around biodiversity. Uh, KECO, which is uh, uh, a program on teaching around sustainability and also in our executive education, the sustainability takes place in executive MBA, for example. Uh, we teach uh, more than 100 courses on sustainability at the moment. Uh, you can do a minor at the Turku Business School in, in sustainability and, and sust I mean sustainable business in particular. Uh, we have the competence development around this currently management training entrepreneurship services, and the campus cooperation covers both alumni network and employer services. Uh, what we are planning to do, uh, this might be interesting for you in, in case you are interested, um, we are planning to, to engage um, uh, our constituencies in, in the research and innovation area around building responsible business academy, which is a, will be a virtual uh, unit where people who have common interest on the uncertain topics can find each other, discuss them and, and share ideas and build on them. <clears throat> Whether they are coming with the individuals from inside the university or, or outside from companies and public organizations. Company Accelerator is uh, one thing that we are planning to support the development of sustainability and sustainable business in companies. Research fund, we are building uh, where you can where you can contribute if you're willing to, uh, uh, which will then um, contribute obviously to to the research and innovation projects. Uh, we will be in teaching and education. We will be we are going to have or moving forward uh, shared base courses to all faculties in the university available, and and specialized courses by faculty, specialized management training, virtual micro credentials you can also will or you will be able to take uh, 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 virtually over the internet on on sustainable business provided by the university and uh, obviously the campus cooperation with our alumni network and employer services will continue around this topic also and uh, just to conclude with the with the final slide here uh, what what are the channels and who to contact uh, i mean uh, from the organizational perspective, um, you know, if you're interested in research and innovation, there, there are co-founded research programs, innovation services available. Uh, from the teaching and education perspective, uh, teaching cooperation, you, you can take part on our courses. We can, we can be teaching together on certain topics which are important for, for your organization. Uh, and uh, obviously the, the assignments that uh, we can work together with. Uh, and uh, uh, like, uh, uh, like when people are finalizing their master's degrees, they, they do their thesis together with you.
competence development, uh, management training, entrepreneurship services, and the alumni community is, has been very active lately also. And here on the right-hand corner, you can find some, some uh, examples of the organizational unit. Juha, who was presenting today, earlier comes from the Finland Futures Research Center, and uh, obviously all the faculties, you can find the key persons in, on, on the internet on, uh, on the university website. But Jan, I think I will, I will conclude here uh, today uh, uh, in case there are some questions or comments the audience would like to make. Thank you, Riku. Thank you. There seems to be many things actually that are ongoing within universities that are trying to help furthering the transition towards sustainability. Um, in, in, can you, could you describe in a, in a rather concrete way how a firm that is interested in responsible business could initiate cooperation uh, with a university? Yeah, okay. uh, good question, Jan. I think, um, you know, what, what you can do if you are interested, you can go on, on I think, obviously, the e-channel is one of them. You can go on the website and just the university website, utu.fi, and punch in responsible business. And, and you will be landing on the, on, on the, on the pages where, where the responsi responsibil responsible business and sustainability is described. And there are all the contact information of, of the key individuals, obviously, uh, available. And uh, I mean, one way is, of, of course, uh, to approach directly uh, the individuals, for example, myself, uh, who have been presenting today on this on this webinar. But the contact information is basically on the on the university website, and there you can find very specialized skills around different topics, from engineering to 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 healthcare and and business around the sustainability, the sustainable business. Is there anything that you as a representative of the university would expect a company to have or to know or to possess if they were to if, if they were interested in such cooperation? Yeah, uh, I mean, that's a good point, because obviously university is sometimes uh, perceived as a, as a theoretical, uh, very theoretical, maybe sometimes even difficult to approach, you know, unless you know what you are talking about and finding the exact right individual. But we are trying to um, um, you know, um, work on, on that topic to make research and innovation, teaching and education together with our constituencies easier. And I, I mean, it is just, I, I know very well that there are companies who have, uh, if we take it in the scale of three, who have, who recognize the topic, you know? And it's enough that you recognize that this is a topic. Maybe you are wondering, you know, uh, how how can we benefit from this, or how can we contribute to this? And uh, I mean, that's uh, that's obviously the first stage. And 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 uh, uh, either you are interested in in the economical side of uh, sustainability and sustainable business, or or societal side, or 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 both of them, or combining the third element of ecological side of them, and how. Just, just to understand these topics. Or maybe you are already working on a project that you realize that uh, we need to start building on this. Uh, we need to take it into account in our value chain somehow. And you have already started some project or a, a project around this topic. Uh, then you can approach us. Or I, I think we can also answer very industry specific questions. You know, what does this mean? What does sustainable business really mean for pharma? What does it mean for healthcare? Uh, what does it mean for retailing and, 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 and other industries? And if you go to the website, you can also re you will realize that there are also many companies already involved with the University of Turku around this topic. But uh, my answer to that, Jan, is that uh, uh, there's, there no, there's no specific requirement. As long as you are interested and uh, I mean, feel free go to the website or contact, for example, myself directly, and I will help out and make sure that you will start talking to the right individual or the right entity in the university. You mentioned already 
basically the diversity that exists within responsible business and also I think about what it means and uh, I think in the very beginning of your presentation you showed three cornerstones of of responsible business values being one now I think it would be probably too optimistic to think that values are the same um, across societies or even within societies so how do we arrive at a common understanding of what actually responsible business is? Yes, I mean, um, yeah, that's a good point. And I mean, there's nothing to be ashamed of, you know, if you are um, a, a business leader and, and you see that my my first priority is to build, uh, you know, to to create economical value to the to the shareholder or um, or or value business I mean value to the to the customer um, but maybe you already uh, started thinking that maybe there's uh, uh, for example um, it might be beneficial for us to to take into account maybe from the customer perspective maybe we can build a, a greater customer base if we include the societal value or environmental value in our our thinking I'll, I'll give an example I think maybe it is helpful to give an example I had one uh, very interesting uh, uh, discussions with one of the with one of the world's leading pharma organizations, and and we discussed that what does responsible business mean for us? Is it just that we we produce uh, pills, you know, uh, so that we don't we minimize the level of waste, or is it so that uh, okay uh, we think that in in pharma, uh, I think we were discussing that. Maybe it's more. Maybe it's not just these no-brainer things, but uh, maybe it's a broader topic. You know, how do we build value to our our client? Like, if we take a pharma organization and we take a healthcare district, for example, specialized healthcare, uh, secondary healthcare. Uh, you know, you can you pharma business can um, build a lot of value if they if they uh, work together with their clients to understand. You know, how do we make the the the, the service more efficient uh, to produce better value. Maybe we can uh, rationalize on, on, on the service processes. If uh, we talk to our, our healthcare client, like let's say secondary healthcare, you know, how our medication will make the, the service processes more simple. Uh, and uh, I mean, that could be one approach. And, and clearly, not, we it doesn't have to be so that everybody's interested in all. I mean, maybe you can start start somewhere and, and start building on these other aspects of, uh, of sustainability. And obviously taking it from, the, from another angle, if we cannot produce economical value in the, in the long term, uh, it doesn't help really, you know, if we are producing a lot of societal value, environmental value only, because uh, we are not going to be in the business for a long. Okay, so it is it is basically a form of uh, negotiation about what is important and uh, where the priorities need to lay. Yes, and where to start, where to start, mm -hmm. you know, maybe grab the low hanging fruits and then uh, take a more longer perspective, like the time dimension, you know, uh, how do we contribute in, in the, how, do, how can this contribute to our value chain and, and growing our business in, in the long term? And while okay. producing social and environmental value simultaneously, and and I mean, and there's no uh, there's no silver bullet, you know. You need to start somewhere, start working on it. Uh, I mean, in, in the English language, there's a, there's a good term, you know. Either you can discover something that uh, you take the cover of the box, for example, you discover it and look into the box, uh, and I I would say that. The answers usually are very seldom found like that. It's more about creation, you know, if we think about change. It's less about discovering things, but more about creation, being involved with the society, maybe talking to a university individuals. Maybe we can help you guys with some of the make, making some of the uh, shortcuts in, in, in developing your, your thinking around this. Creation. Start somewhere, build together, maybe together with the university. Okay, here is a, a comment or um, maybe even a statement uh, from the audience. Counting the cost. Can econ economists calculate all costs related to a project? 
if they can, that should be the guideline to implement. Ecologists attempt to do so, but economists consider them not uh, to be non-practical and off the ground. In my opinion, those economists who could be certified to carry out comprehensive cost calculations should be called ecologists, which refers to the highest qualification of economic sciences. Okay, uh, I think I understand the point there behind. First of all, obviously, you can calculate. Uh, there, are, there are methods uh, available. I'm not sure if you can calculate everything and all the aspects very comprehensively, but you can start from somewhere and there are tools available in the internet. Uh, at least, and for example, I think there's one Finnish company who is heavily involved in this and, and most of the consultants have calculation methods for that. And uh, if I understood the statement correctly, obviously you should calculate not just the economical value, but also the environmental and societal value that you are, you are building. And I mean, the societal value, uh, for example, health, it, you can always turn it into economical calculation. And an economical calculation, you can turn into societal calculation. For example, uh, I think the discussion, discussion uh, uh, on our healthcare system has been very lively, obviously, due to the election process and the election lately. But I, but I think the thing is that uh, you always need to take into account that how do I... How do I um, how do I contribute uh, not how do I contribute how do I make these things more effective and efficient uh, and uh, I, I would say that these environmental, social, and economical aspects are just different angles to look at things and you can always turn one to another if you take an economist and put it with a, with a, some, somebody who is involved with the environmental issues. I think they can find a solution that will will uh, satisfy both of them, those individuals. Mm. Well, the answer I, is that yes, you can. I interpreted the, the statement in a way that what we need is um, basically a, a merger of economists and ecologists. And that is what is called for in the university landscape. If we talk about the kind of education that we that we offer, uh, if until recently business schools have been basically a tool to upkeep a certain way of, of thinking about um, how we do business, um, yes. how, how markets are organized, uh, then I think um, the kind of transition that we, we are calling for and we are also talking about in this seminar in in the world outside universities uh, in, in business organizations in the public sector this kind of change that is also taking place within the universities and um, i think that this statement is a a good one that shows um how we need to rethink maybe also the kind of professions that we are we are um bringing about through our education yes jan we just wrote uh, just one more example we wrote it because it's i think on everybody's lips uh, to the election is that uh, we wrote an article in, in Kaupalehti the month ago, basically came out, um, is that, you know, people are saying, okay, we, we need, do we need salary increases in some professions in healthcare? And, and it's a fair requirement, as long as you can improve the productivity so that we can pay for that. And, and I think that would be an example of producing both economical value to the individuals, but also societal value, more well-being to the society. Okay, thank you, thank you, Riku, for your insights. Um, it is time to to continue um, with Katrina Sivonen on cultural sustainability transformation. Katrina, please go ahead. So, thank you for inviting me to this uh, webinar. This is, has been really interesting. My topic is cultural sustainability transformation. Uh, as a background, I would uh, like to um, tell you that uh, in my work, in my uh, research and education, I'm combining uh, futures research. Uh, as you can see, I am from Finland Futures Research Center, and I'm combining uh, cultural heritage research, uh, which is the uh, uh, subject of my adjunct professorship. Um, and then I'm uh, combining sustainable uh, sustainability uh, studies. 
So uh, futures, uh, culture and sustainability in a combination. And this is also the perspective I use today when I'm talking about this uh, uh, cultural sustainability transformation. And as we have uh, uh, already heard today many times, uh, we need a, a sustainability transformation. And I start, even though I'm speaking about cultural issues, I, I begin from this uh, kind of basic uh, uh, problems, ecological problems, which are decreasing uh, the resilience of our living environment and destroying also prerequisites for well-being, both for human beings and uh, other living beings. There has been already many decades ago a, a notion about leverage points for systemic uh, sustainability transformation. Um, these are these kind of uh, uh, points in the society where we could have, a, a, where it is possible to have a strong impact towards sustainability. Uh, and then there is also uh, a notion about uh, the need to operate on the deepest levels of uh, these um, leverage points in order to reach the transformation. And thirdly, there is a notion, and this comes from this article, which I have as a reference, the option at all, the 2017, uh, that policy interventions typically does not address the deep level uh, leverage points and those fails in their target uh, of uh, sustainability transformation, which is an interesting notion in, in this kind of issue when we see sustainable development usually as this kind of policy uh, issue and uh, a collection of policy interventions. The deepest level of leverage points consists of worldviews, human nature relationships, um, and from them arising goals, actions, habits, and practices. Uh, for instance, absent all and uh, the, the researchers from environmental uh, uh, research uh, subjects uh, do not mention uh, that the, these are cultural issues, but from the perspective of cultural research, it's obvious that these are basic cultural expressions. So we can say that uh, these uh, deepest level leverage points consist of uh, issues uh, uh, which um, are cultural, which are a form, uh, so to say, a layer to all uh, of our societal uh, and everyday actions. Uh, there, we have been talking today about the uh, circular economy, about healthcare issues, about food, about different kinds of issues, and this cultural layer is uh, present uh, in all of these. Uh, and they define uh, our uh, everyday life, human everyday life, and they are also defined by human everyday life. So the human impact on nature, for instance, uh, comes from this, uh, is, could be explained from this perspective. Uh, so uh, if um, uh, the most important level of leverage points then consist of cultural expressions, then um, as a part of global sustainability transformation, uh, it is obvious that we need cultural sustainability transformation. So we need a transformation in our worldviews, human nature relationships, knowledge, skills, actions, habits, and practices. And all of these belongs to intangible culture. When we use culture in an instrumental way, uh, for instance, in social or economic or political contexts, then they are defined as intangible cultural heritage. So every time when we use culture as a tool to reach something, uh, it, it is cultural heritage. It is raised up as something special in order to uh, uh, then reach some goal. Uh, and culture and cultural heritage have an impact everywhere in, in the society. So this is the reason why it uh, certainly is important in sustainability transformation too. But then it is um, also obvious that we, we need an ethical reflection uh, in this context. So there we, we have now a normative goal, cultural sustainability transformation requires 
changes in cultural expressions. So every individual have their own cultural expressions, word use, have its practices and so far. And uh, for instance, uh, uh, from the other perspective, we ha have a respect for human rights. For instance, United Nations Human Rights Declaration, and this is a quotation from it. Everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set for this declaration uh, without distinction of any kind such as, and there is a long list of different issues, but also political and other opinions uh, mentioned there. And these are part of our worldviews, which now we should change. Uh, so you can see that there is a tension between this normative gold and uh, for instance, uh, 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 individual rights to keep uh, own worldviews. Uh, if we think from the perspective of research, uh, uh, ethics in cultural research uh, says that we need to have a respect for the diversity of human beings and communities, so their different uh, cultural expressions uh, and uh, their rights uh, um, of their own cultural expressions. So then uh, again, this is supporting this human rights uh, perspective. Uh, ethical uh, perspective of uh, professional cultural research. Uh, but if we go further in this ethical reflection and find, to try to find solutions, so we can see that from a philosophical perspective, uh, all human beings, including researchers, have a responsibility to uh, safeguard the future of both nature and human life, which of course are connected to each other. Uh, from uh, futures research, uh, professional responsibility perspective, the, it, it lies uh, in the uh, support given to people. And this is a, a, again a quotation, become aware of the values um, that guide their actions through the consequences uh, that may arise from them. So futures researchers uh, professional responsibility is to help to people to see how their values, which kind of values uh, or which kind of impacts their values have to different kind of futures. So uh, this is a kind of bridge, I think, between uh, this uh, uh, goal which we have uh, from sustainability transformation and uh, uh, for instance, uh, human rights and cultural rights of, of people. Uh, so when combining cultural heritage research, futures research and sustainability say, uh, science for co-creation of cultural sustainability transformation, uh, we can see that there is a need to find a balance between these different ethical standpoints. What is then the culture? I think uh, it is uh, also important to think a little bit uh, this if we use culture as tool what it is about and different views definitions gives uh, uh, give us a, a different view to culture and what part of it can be used uh, uh, for different uh, goals uh, and uh, sorry i'm going back to this uh, still there's two basically different definitions of culture, framework, and river. Uh, and I take first this framework, culture as a structure, which gives uh, then a framework for social activities. And this is a really famous American uh, anthropologist, Clifford Gertz, who has defined uh, culture in this way. Uh, so then if we think uh, from culture sustainability perspective, uh, what, what is important in culture from this perspective, it is preservation and safeguarding of cultures in plural form and cultural elements belonging to these cultures. So uh, this is, for, for instance, then uh, cultural expressions and the rights of uh, people to their own cultural expressions. And this is uh, really important, for instance, from the perspective of cultural rights of indigenous people, which is a, a global discussion topic nowadays. This other uh, definition, group of definitions, uh, culture as a river, uh, see cul culture as a global social process uh, in which culture is con constantly renewed and co-created in 
interaction both between human beings and between human beings and their tangible and intangible environment. And this in that environment that is both human made and nature. Uh, so uh, cultural sustainability, what is important uh, in culture from this perspective uh, is the safeguarding of the living process of culture and also the transformative power of culture. Because if culture is always changing, there is at least implicit transformative power always. But how to take this in use is then the question. And according to this view, I also see culture as a part of nature. What is then important uh, uh, if you use culture is the uh, uh, inclusion and participation of uh, all human beings. Uh, so the core, as I see, of cultural sustainability is the right of people to take part and have an impact uh, on their own culture uh, when we see culture as a framework and the right of people to take part and have an impact on the cultural change in their own cultural environment if we see culture as a river. And this is always happening together with other people. But then it is obvious that uh, this does not guarantee the direction of the cultural change to sustainability of any dimension, not to, to ecological sustainability, but not uh, either to uh, economic, social or cultural sustainability, because there is many different values. People have different values and different aims in their lives. Uh, but safeguarding of cultural heritage uh, uh, as uh, in the framework uh, definition of culture can support, for instance, resilience of people, can create a, a cooperation in different communities and support resilience of people in order to be able, for instance, to adapt in climate change or climate change mitigation or, or other economic, ecological problems. But this does not create the uh, uh, cultural sustainability transformation. Uh, for instance, safeguarding of cultural heritage as such. But in spite of this, the, the possibility to take part and have an impact uh, uh, can be seen uh, as a condition of cultural sustainability transformation. Without participation, we do not have uh, any cultural sustain sustainability transformation. So then uh, I will give you a, a now on this uh, last slide, one uh, possibility, uh, uh, one tool for cultural sustainability transformation, which I suggest could be used. Uh, and uh, this is heritage futures. Uh, heritage futures, which are based on intangible cultural heritage. There is also a, a other kind of definitions of uh, heritage futures, but uh, if it's based on intangible cultural heritage, so word use, knowledge, skills, actions, habits, and practices. Uh, this uh, heritage could be a tool which can be formed and used uh, as a means to co-direct cultural transformation towards more sustainable world in a participatory process. Uh, this kind of heritage futures requires disruptive co-creation of selected cultural elements and care of their sustainable impacts on nature and human beings. Not so much uh, the heritage as such, but their impacts on nature and human beings. And also care of the transformative power of culture uh, is part of this kind of heritage futures. So heritage futures are uh, intentionally co-created human nature relationships, including new types of meanings and actions which produce sustainable development. So to give uh, people a possibility to co-create new kind of meanings to different kind of actions could then help them to change their actions towards some more sustainable ones. And this could be possible uh, in everyday life, but also in economic, political, administrational uh, spheres of, of society, because culture, uh, so to say, forms this kind of layer to all kind of actions uh, in, in the society. 
Then I have some preferences here, um, and I would like to thank you for your attendance. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you for opening up this uh, the complexity of of um, a sustainability transformation on this human and interhuman level. Um, I think in the beginning you started off by saying that um, policy and and regulatory changes themselves they they will not do the job. They are not enough, and only these kind of deep changes on a human and interhuman level they can bring forth the desired sustainable change and then you you pointed out uh, something that struck me uh, and a very crucial tension that you see there which is um, that if we want to achieve the kind of change that we are all talking about now then uh, we need to change our cultural expressions at the same time, however, you show that, or you said that uh, everybody has the right to express themselves in, in a certain way. Um, so I'm, I'm now wondering how do these, how can we make these two things fit together? So this is the, the core of this uh, uh, cultural sustainability, that this inclusion and participation. So we cannot do this kind of changes uh, or, or they, they can be done only uh, if people, people are voluntarily involved in these processes. And if there is some, some kind of uh, tools for them to be voluntarily involved in these processes. And then uh, uh, interaction, discussion, co-creation of new kind of, uh, uh, new kinds of uh, values, new, new kinds of practices together with the uh, uh, other people. I think this is the only um, solution, and there is always this tension, uh, so so to say, baked in these processes. So uh, you must always balance with these different uh, ethical perspectives, ethical issues. Uh, I, I would not say that this is the only uh, way. Political uh, interventions has all, always, of course, a role, but uh, I, I think the, we, are, we need both of these. So uh, these political uh, uh, actions uh, do not uh, go deep enough or, or they are not successful if we do not combine it with this kind of cultural sustainability transformation. This is how I understand this. Indeed, and that is something that we can see, we can witness nowadays across the globe in areas or parts of the world where uh, trust in in the government and states is is low. Um, that's I think where people do not feel very lenient to following uh, the recommendations or the regulations or guidelines set by by authorities. Um, I'm now wondering. Uh, you say that uh, participation, so a, a process that includes everyone, is needed. But, but does, doesn't that process in itself actually also aim at people then voluntarily changing their cultural expressions? Yeah, that, that is the core of this issue. We cannot uh, uh, tell anyone to change their, their opinions. So, uh, but uh, as we have heard today uh, in this discussion, we have actually in our society uh, quite many people in different task, uh, tasks in the, the society who would like to find solutions uh, towards the more sustainable world. So to begin with uh, these people uh, and on voluntary basis and to uh, find uh, uh, ways how they can uh, change uh, their ideas. So I think we, we are now in this kind of uh, a uh, really heavy uh, transition period globally. And there is, uh, in this kind of periods, there is always uh, tensions and different kind of uh, 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 values which are uh, uh, colliding with each other uh, and tensions. So then uh, to work with um, those who voluntarily would like to do this and would like to find uh, better solutions. Uh, for instance, uh, even though if you um, 
think positively about the uh, sustainability transformation uh, and you might feel that you, your human nature is really strong, uh, it might not help you to connect the uh, overconsumption to human rights relationships. So to help uh, those people who think positively about sustainability transformation to find these kind of uh, uh, combinations uh, of, uh, or, or relationships between consumption and their own human nature relationships, what kind of issues they, to understand what all kind of issues could be included in human nature uh, relationships. So, so I think there is lots to do uh, with those people also who have this kind of positive mindset. And then they, uh, when this process goes further, they could then, we could ha have more and more people who find this important. Uh, partly it might also become this kind of uh, tacit, new kind of tacit knowledge habits which we do notice, but we are already thinking differently. And this might also then involve new kind of people in these processes. Mm. I would like to pick up um, a somewhat related question from the audience. Um, talking about change of culture, how to change, for example, toxic masculine behavior on a cultural level? This affects a lot on energy and food sectors. Uh, yes, I think these uh, same kind of issues are, are uh, should be used also here. Uh, this kind of um, uh, voluntary involvement and discussion. So uh, it could be, if food uh, is, is a good example, it's happening in everyday life, it could be in families, for instance, then. So, so if there is this kind of understanding that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, um, vegetable-based protein is uh, this kind of heritage future and uh, some uh, other, other uh, animal-based uh, uh, proteins uh, are not then to talk about this. This is more valuable for, for environment uh, constantly in, in, uh, in families, for instance, or in workplaces to uh, have uh, different alternatives for in, in restaurants and, and so far. So step by step, I think that the, this change is possible. So uh, I, I'm an optimist, <laughs> or I, I would like to keep uh, my optimism in, in the, these issues. It is possible to change. Um, uh, and maybe to avoid to say uh, toxic masculinity because it uh, puts a stempel to these people. Mm. I see what you mean. Um... Here is another related question, somewhat related. Uh, what is the role of futures literacy for sustainable life of uh, the smart city generations, among other types of new literacies? Yes, futures literacy is an uh, inter interesting uh, uh, concept. Uh, it means uh, 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 an ab uh, ability to see different kind of uh, really different alternatives of, of really different futures, uh, something which is different than the, our current uh, day, both uh, in the ways of uh, values, for instance, uh, and the meanings of different kind of actions. And so, so it could help because if there is this kind of ability to imagine really different futures, then it helps to find new kind of solutions and it could uh, then fasten, for instance, this uh, uh, cultural changing process towards sustainability. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Um, those were the questions raised from, from the audience so far. Thanks for, uh, again, for opening up a, a topic um, on, I think, on a level that um, we maybe haven't talked about so much today, but which is definitely important um thinking that uh, we can create structures and incentives around us human beings but if we ourselves are not willing to to adapt or to accept uh, what is offered to us then um or one could even say if we're not willing to create those uh, or reproduce those structures 
then I think it will be difficult to create uh, lasting change in terms of sustainability. So thanks a lot. And uh, we move on to our uh, last presentation for today um, with Maya Rita Ollila on global ethics for the future. Maya Rita, please. Thank you, Jan, and thank you, Katrina, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, and welcome everyone to philosophize about the future of global ethics. And of course, from the point of view of sustainability. I would like to start with a poem by a Sufi poet, Rumi. Beyond all ideas of right and wrong, there is a field. I will meet you there. I might just as well stop here because this is pretty much everything I'm going to say. But since different people interpret metaphors in different ways, I might explain a little bit my point of view. Uh, I'm going to claim that we need shared core values to solve global wicked problems, but not to destroy uh, the cultural richness uh, and diversity that we just heard about. But in order to find the global values as a basis for action, we need to have a, uh, have a field of shared experience of reality. I'll explain in a second. And next, uh, our ethics must evolve. It has evolved thus far, but it must evolve further. And we need a fair dialogue on global values. What do I mean with a shared experience of reality? When we plan practical action, like measures to prevent and mitigate climate change, we have to know where we are now. That's the empirical premise of our deduction. And then we need to know where we are going because values are ends of action on the most general level. Uh, let us think about something that the former US president Donald Trump used to say, climate changes and then it changes back. If this is our grasp of reality, the facts that reflect the reality then what are the values that we're heading for? I, I guess there is no end to reach if we think that climate changes independently of human beings. Or take another example, uh, whether to get vaccinated against COVID-19 or not. We have realized that people uh, rely on different sources of information when they want to get vaccinated and when they don't. Again, our grasp of the current reality pretty much uh, affects the values that we entertain. And to further point out why our grasp of reality is important, we might uh, remind ourselves of something that uh, Thomas M. Jones uh, coined to the discussion of moral philosophy. Uh, why is it that some people think that abortion is the most important uh, discussion in moral philosophy? And why others think that climate change or loss of bio biodiversity might be the most important things? Uh, Jones claim that there are six uh, determinants of the importance of a moral issue in an individual's thought the significance of the consequences, the social consensus, whether others think the same, the probability of the consequences uh, taking place, the temporal immediacy, is it temporarily close to us or distant in the future, the proximity of the issue to the decision-making, how close it's to my personal life and the concentration of effects. Does it affect many people or only a few? So uh, as, are you still with me? I hope that I made the point why uh, facts matter. Uh, values are not logically deduced from facts, but uh, they sort of supervene as moral philosophers say, they rest on the facts. 
Uh, what about ethics then? Very often we use ethics as something that is backward looking, something bad has happened and then we judge it. But uh, talking about sustainability, we need orientation towards the future. And ethics itself needs to evolve. Fortunately, it already has. We can imagine that uh, in the beginning of moral thought in humans, other non-human animals also have sort of rudimentary morality. But uh, from the human point of view, ethics was applied to one's own tribe. Then uh, all of a sudden to all other people outside one's own tribe. And then during the last century, especially uh, sentient animals got the status of moral subjects. And the latest discovery was that islands, trees, and even mother nature are included in the realm of morality. But uh, also the purpose of morality has changed. We used to say that morality deals with human well-being in an ultimate way. And now we know that uh, there is a precondition for this well-being and it's the well-being of the entire biosphere. And we might also think that the entire biosphere has intrinsic value in itself. Or we used to say that the purpose of morality is to alleviate the human predicament. And now we know that all living beings are subjects of morality. But talking about the field, Ethics has been and still is a battlefield. Not everybody agrees. Uh, we can't imagine every, everyone agreeing on our own goals. Uh, Jan remarked that there is a certain tension when talking about cultural values and sustainability values. And this same dilemma exists in the discussion between relativists and uh, universalizable ethics. As we all know, cultural relativists hold that value, values are culturally dependent. There are differences in uh, different cultures at different times, and that proves that values are and or always will be relativistic. Not so fast. Uh, relativism has many uh, logical and other problems. I can't go into them today, but uh, uh, I'm sure that there is a case for moral objectivists as well. But those who are relativists uh, tend to think that global ethics has been a Western project with all these human rights, etc. And isn't that a form of neocolonialism? You may come from an ancient culture uh, whose model, uh, moral ideals might be based on Bhagavad Gita or uh, for Confucian taught in China. And then you feel that don't you come here with your colonialistic uh, uh, value uh, sets uh, because we have our own. Uh, if this is the experience, uh, there possibly can't be agreement on uh, global core values. And one more field that shows uh, the disc discrepancy of values is social media. It seems to be a minefield in itself. You might say something that will, will create uh, disapproval, uh, may hurt your life in many ways. And one of those issues is the difference between conservative and liberal values. The moral psychologist Jonathan Haidt wrote the influential book, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. And he found out that there was a set of six foundational value sets, care versus harm, fairness versus cheating, loyalty versus betrayal, authority versus subversion, sanctity versus declaration, and liberty versus oppression. 
and and there was a stark difference. Here we have uh, uh, an exposition of the fact that both liberals and conservatives tend to have the same values, but to a different degree. And if you want to con um, convince somebody of your values, you realize that telling the other person to change her values is not a good strategy. Uh, a much better strategy would uh, to provide information, uh, a new a view of the reality that might affect in such a way that the other person sees things from a different per perspective and is willing to maybe negotiate about values. I mentioned that the global ethics project has been on uh, the basis of Western ethics. And when Hans uh, Küng created the set of global ethic in, in 1989, he remarked that it's not a new invention, but only a new discovery of common principles, which are as old as humankind. And we all know that the golden rule is such an ancient principles, principle. And later on, we have emphasized human rights. Aren't these adequate uh, as the basis of global ethics? Uh, previously, I stated that ethics should evolve. And this means that a golden rule and human rights were a wonderful starting point. And now there is a need to move further. We human beings gave ourselves the human rights and that was great, but what next? Should we take other living beings into account in the same way? Well, this is new ethics. It has not existed before, not in those cultures that we know about. And that reminds me of the parable in the Bible. Uh, there is no point in putting new wine into old wineskins for fear that the skins will be burst by the new wine. And what's worse, uh, no man having had old wine has any desire for new, for he says the old is better. And that may be a little problem related to our cultural heritage. It's very valuable to us, but what if we need it to move, move further? Max Planck talk, talk, talked about uh, uh, the progress of science. And he thought that it's not very easy to change one's paradigm about values, uh, about science. He said that science advances one funeral at a time. And I'm not saying that change of values towards the new ethics uh, must be slow, uh, but uh, so far it has not taken over as quickly as some people might have hoped. Uh, those ideas have been around for a few decades, uh, but not yet. We're not quite there yet. Well, uh, do these new moral sensibilities require that uh, we actually become more sensitive to all other non-human animals and the rest of the nature? Not necessarily. We can develop this heightened sensitivity to the intrinsic value of living beings, or we can simply realize the fact that we are dependent on the rest of the nature. And to protect it is the key to promoting human well being. So, a rather self interested point of view might lead to the action that is similar to the action of those who have heightened sensitivity. And just to remind ourselves about the meaning of intrinsic value, it is the opposite of instrumental value. Intrinsic value means that something is uh, important and valuable as such in its own right. And uh, the 
other option is instrumental value. Well, uh, so far I claim that we need an experience of reality that we can share with each other to find the core values on which we can base our actions. But uh, the last decades uh, have been about discussions that prove it impossible for us all to experience reality from the same point of view. But could there be an intersection of our different experiences of reality? I believe so. On a very basic level, uh, Andrew M. Bailey uh, talks about uh, the experience we have about personhood. Uh, it feels that I'm something different from my body, the animal in, in me, as Bailey says. But then Bailey asks, consider a few ways in which someone might harm your animal. The human animal you see when you look in the mirror, beating up your animal, depriving your animal of oxygen, or even killing it. Were someone to do one of these things to your animal, would you, the person, be harmed? And what Bailey is trying to do is create a bridge of our experience of personhood and our animal nature, pointing out that we need all the preconditions of life that other animals and all living beings on this planet need. And as we recall, ethics has been based on personhood all the time. It has been about us as uh, maybe the kind of persons that Immanuel Kant talked about. But he also forbid suicide because when somebody kills the human being, the personhood is lost in the same way. And that's what Bailey is also saying. So I think that on a very basic level, we all share an experience uh, that we want to cherish, living uh, as a human body and person on this planet. So I, I have claimed that we do share interests with the rest of the nature and our interests are intertwined with the interests of other life forms on the planet. And the interest we have is the interest to live. So I hope that I have pointed out that we can share the field, but how can we meet there? The dialogue on values uh, needs to be with fair rules. Is it possible? It seems to me that many people have pretty much lost their hope these days, more than at any other time in history, mankind faces a crossroads. One part leads to despair and other hopelessness, the other to total extinction. Let us pray we have the wisdom to choose correctly, says Woody Allen. Not, uh, not quite my style of argument. I would say that we have these possibilities of dialogue. But we first have to think who are invited to the meeting in the field. Well, these guys definitely not. We are the, uh, we the people have to decide not only for other living beings, but for future generations as well. But it's important that when we talk about nations globe wide, everyone has access. And uh, there will be a level playing field for all discussions. Justice is something that inspires every person everywhere in the world. And we remember that these kind of ideals were alive even during the French Revolution. Liberté, égalité, and fraternité. What we have forgotten is that there was an auxiliary, auxiliary word, ou l'amour. Uh, liberty was so important that the choice was death. 
it was finally abolished because it gave some ideas about some misinterpretations about the word. But uh, there is a newcomer in the field of justice, which is difference. Nations are different. And some of them feel that in the climate summits, they should not be paying for those nations that have caused the problems, for example. No worries, uh, there is, uh, for example, the theories of Amartya K. Sen, uh, who take uh, this difference into account. Uh, now I've used too much time, so I won't go deeper into the uh, ways of having this dialogue. We all know about uh, Habermas's theory of ideal speech. Uh, situation, the postulate of openness, the postulate of freedom of speech, the postulate of authenticity, and postulate of reciprocity. And uh, even though Habermas himself took some distance to his earlier work later, uh, these things still correspond pretty much to our intuition of a good dialogue. It can be done. But we face this little dilemma, this little challenge. The uh, ground of all this dialogue is trust. Fortunately, we all can work for it, whether we are individuals, whether we participate as uh, business, businesses or uh, states or members of a civil society, we can work for the trust. So. Let us meet in the field uh, sometime soon, I hope. Thank you. Thank you, Maya Rita. Thanks for uh, this um, philosophical take on, on the possibility of global ethics. Um, you talked about how to find shared core values. That's how you started with. And um, I think it was picked up more or less explicitly in previous uh, discussions today already, um, and it was showed how, how difficult that is, um, since they, as you said, values can be seen as, as culturally bound and through that they can be very different. You made an interesting um, uh, statement, you said that values rest on facts. Um, I, I would now like to propose that values are also a basis for how we interpret facts. Uh, so there is sort of a a cyclical relationship. So how can we change this? How can we break, I don't want to say break because it's so violent, but how can we modify this cycle? I absolutely agree with you. We pick the facts on the basis of our values. And, and there is a circle in which our values determine how we choose the facts. And then we, of course, uh, uh, get more convinced that our view of the world, our fact picking was correct. And then we act on the basis of those facts that we have picked and, and the circle goes on and on. And that's why I think that um, the, the realm of uh, personal experience of, of reality is so very important because it's the only way that uh, non-violently makes people change their beliefs. Let's say that somebody gets seriously ill and then later on when interviewed, she says that that's changed her values. She now had a different experience about life and the priorities she had were changed. But now <laughs> the problem in actual fact is that if we can act together to do something, it will change our beliefs. But how to get started? If someone is stuck with his or her beliefs about something and doesn't want to experiment, what to do? And we talked about health, for example, and many of us have suggested to other people new ways to improve their health. And what people do, normally nothing, <laughs> because they, they feel that they are required to do something that they are not willing to do. And I, I absolutely agree that this circle should be, I would say, even violently broken. 
there should uh, be something that helps people to see reality from a different perspective. And that is happening as we speak. Climate change is beginning to show in our lives. But the problem is that it happens too late this way. If we have to wait till everybody feels in their own lives all the problems related to climate change and loss of biodiversity, then we are definitely too late. So please, Jan, help me solve the problem. I, I wish I could just like that. I, I will. I'll try and, and pose uh, another or raise another issue. Uh, which you actually mentioned. And um, if I understood correctly, you were talking about the relationship between humans and nature. Um, I do recall a certain definition of, of values that um, it is a very old one, I think about 70 years old, uh, where values have been put into certain categories or approached from certain angles. And one angle was actually exactly the relationship between humans and, and nature. And what we find, especially in, in the Northern Hemisphere and the Global North <clears throat> is um, a mastery relationship. So human beings mastering uh, nature, which means that um, we often see nature as a, as a resource and we, we use it as we uh, think we need it in a certain moment. And I'm trying to say this now in a, in a uh, non-judgmental way <laughs> trying to uh, and then there is um, maybe a more neutral relationship between the nature and human beings and then there is the other way um, around a, a relationship where human beings are sort of uh, subversive to to nature and I um, if I'm not mistaken there are for example certain indigenous peoples who who uh, take this or assume that kind of position with regards to nature so to them nature is is not something that you mold to your own liking or use as you as you would like to but nature sort of uh, is you could see it as sort of even dominating or people live according to nature so is this then something that we need is this where we need to get well as you suspect we might have been there but then then we accepted this mastery metaphor we felt that our technological innovations are so massive that we can actually take control of the rest of the nature. And, and then we cut ourselves loose. And, and that, I think, may have been fatal. And because those ethical systems that are based on the idea of mastery have been heavily criticized because of this, uh, this uh, autonomous independent role that we accepted for ourselves. And, and that's uh, why great ideas like uh, human rights uh, are to me not any longer adec adequate as such, because it means that uh, we simply uh, forget uh, the rest of the nature and our, our uh, relationship to it. We say very piously that yes, we are part of nature, but we don't mean it. <laughs> we somehow don't don't feel that way. Thank you. Um, I would like to pose as the last question, a question that was raised very early on uh, by somebody in the audience. Uh, and it is maybe a way for you, Majorita, to, to uh, reflect on, on these philosophical thoughts on a, on a very hands-on grassroots level. So somebody asked, um, how should they take sustainability into account when they build a digital global startup? What is important? What should they do if, they, if sustainability was important for them when they set up this new digital global business? Well, now I'm hoping I don't drift too far away because uh, I've been tremendously interested in the ethics of AI. And artificial intelligence is a subclass uh, of digitalization. So I wonder what kind of digital business they are putting together. Uh, if, if I only knew, I could be more specific on that. But the possibilities are, are uh, limitless. When you do something like that, uh, 
globally, you can scale something in ways that have not been possible ever before. And, and you have the possibility to change people's consciousness. That has been seen as a tremendous threat, uh, creating certain kinds of algorithms, algorithms that have an effect on the way we think and the way we act. But it's also a possibility. If, if you have ambition to, uh, to change ways uh, uh, people think and act, you have the possibility. But, but right now, I can't imagine what kind of digital business we're talking about. Do you? Can you help? No, I, unfortunately, I don't, I don't have any more information than, than just this, uh, this one question. But I think it is, it is a, a very good point that you're making, that we should um, think of businesses not only as maybe as the way or in the way that we have perceived it uh, until now, maybe a way of making money or uh, little influences into society and, and picking up such vibes from society to, to make a business function. But I think um, maybe businesses, uh, as, as you said, human rights need to be expanded. Maybe also that the meaning of businesses needs to be expanded as um, something that is part of and serves in a way, not only a certain group of, of uh, stakeholders around the business, but it is, it is part of a, of a larger system. And um, I would like to take this uh, now to um, sort of put a, um, a conclusion on this. And I, I, I've uh, thought about this very much throughout the, the six different um, presentations that we heard today. Uh, it's, we're talking about a very complex and interconnected system change that is, that is uh, needed. That is my take. And um, that is not an easy task. It is, there is an almost endless amount of entry points into how to change. We have heard different ways of how to go about this on different levels, on philosophical levels, on very practical levels, and also in very many different contexts. I think uh, a core message that I would like to pick up is that everybody's needed uh, to co-create the future that we wish for. And um, we need to make sure that everybody's in there. Otherwise, we, we will lose certain people along the way and... Um, that I, th I think history has shown that uh, will not allow for creating the future that we want. That being said, I would like to thank um, all the speakers for their inspiring, thought-provoking speeches. I would like to thank the audience for uh, posing interesting questions. I hope for the audience you got something out of this too. I did very much. It was very interesting and I think it will take a couple of days to process this. Um, please keep in mind there is a recording made of this um, this uh, webinar that you can access on the University of Turku web pages. And if you're interested in, in more webinars of the Sustainable Future series, then please check out information on the University of Turku web pages too. Thank you all and have a nice rest of the day. <laughs>